Thank you, and thank you to the Women's National Republican Club. It's great to be here this morning. Um, you know, this is really a wonderful and historic clubhouse. The organization is so steeped in history of its own as well as in the history of the city, our party, and the country. The Women's National Republican Club was founded by leaders of the suffrage movement. With the new voting rights in mind, the clubhouse was intended to be a place where women could meet and share knowledge about political issues so as to be better informed participants, of course, in the electoral process. As new voters, women could participate in the choice between candidates and their ideas. It is in that spirit that I speak to all of you today. I'm going to talk about the choice America faces in this election. And it's frankly a choice between two paths, two very different paths. And as we make this choice, don't kid yourself, the entire world is watching. The world is watching because America is civilization's brightest beacon. Freedom-loving people depend on our leadership for peace and for stability. Civilization's enemies only seek, only seek for us to fail. You know, presidents come, presidents go, and while a president does really matter, it's the democratic principles that have made us that leader for more than two centuries that have been sturdy enough to transcend political and ideological differences, a civil war, two world wars, and a century of technological and societal upheaval. Through it all, we have remained history's greatest force for good because we've stayed true to who we are. One nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. This election may well be one of the most consequential of many generations because the next president will face so many complex pressures, both from within and from without. They will force tough decisions from not only our leaders, but from every one of us. And we won't always like our options. The issues we confront, from fighting ISIS, handling Russia, China, North Korea, and the Middle East, to addressing displaced workers, civil rights, the new plague of drug addiction at home, as well as slow economic growth and rising debt. Think about it. They're all critical. The importance of making the right choices certainly cannot be understated. It can overload us if we let it. But even in the face of this multitude of complex, thorny problems, clarity can emerge. From the fog of anxiety, the seemingly endless choices can be reduced, and then reduced again, and then reduced again. And they eventually are whittled down to just two. And here they are. Will we turn our backs on the ideals of America that have seen us through more than two centuries? Or are we going to reaffirm that America is, in Ronald Reagan's words, this last best hope for man on earth? Ladies and gentlemen, this is our choice. For some, the challenges we face, the myriad choices, the potential changes that each decision presents, it could, and maybe in some sense, has given rise to fear or anger. And of course, that can be polarizing. The response for some is to retreat into the past, to yearn for the way things used to be. To these people, today's America is only seen as a broken place. And the people who did the breaking are the other people with more money or less money, people with different sounding last names or different religious beliefs or different colored skin or lifestyles or whatever. You get the idea. We have been told that because of all this change, America has become dark, that we have succumbed and that we are no longer strong. 
We are told that we are no longer respected in the world. In fact, we're even told that foreign governments are actually controlling our destiny because they have become smarter than us and tougher than us. This picture of America in economic and moral decline is, of course, always followed up with warnings of our impending destruction. For many Americans, these fears and this outlook are as real as the building we are in today. And the anger they cause is real. It is true we are fighters in America, but we fight for what is good. We fight for what is right. And when we do that, we win, don't we? We win. And don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. When we come together, when we unite as a country, America always wins. For those who are angry or afraid, I want to assure there is another better way to deal with this. Some who feed off of the fears and the anger that is felt by some of us and exploit it feed their own insatiable desires for fame or attention. That could drive America down into a ditch and not make us great again. Just as disturbing are the solutions they offer. We've heard proposals to create a religious test for immigration, to target neighborhoods for surveillance, to deport 11 and a half million people, to impose draconian tariffs which would crush trade and destroy American jobs. We have heard proposals to drop out of NATO, abandon Europe to Russia, possibly use nuclear weapons in Europe, and our, end our defense partnerships in Asia, and tell our Middle East allies that they have to go it alone. We've been offered hollow promises to impose a value-added tax, balance budgets through simple and whimsical cuts in waste, fraud, and abuse. There is no office that has the title of waste, fraud, and abuse. We have been promised that unpopular laws shall be repealed simply through the will of a strong man in the White House, and that the Supreme Court justices will be empowered with some new extra constitutional ability to investigate former public officials. I've stood on a stage and watched with amazement as candidates wallowed in the mud, viciously attacked one another, called each other liars, and disparaged each other's character. Those who continuously push that type of behavior are not worthy of the office they are seeking. As for me, as I have said repeatedly, I will not take the low road to the highest office in the land. I will simply not do it. Just as an all-consuming fear of America in decline ends in visions of America's destruction, a political strategy based on exploiting Americans instead of lifting them up inevitably leads to divisions, paranoia, isolation, and promises that can never, ever be fulfilled. I say to you that this path to darkness is the antithesis of all that America has meant for 240 years. Some have a different response to the pressures they see bearing down on America and themselves. It would never occur to me that America would break or could break from challenges to our economy or to our security. We harden with resolve through ingenuity and coming together. We can't sit by idly and expect fate or destiny to sweep in and rescue us. You see, we always roll up our sleeves and get to work when the going gets tough. And we have never never, ever seen the American spirit fail. America's strength is that we are bound by shared ideas, by communities and families and people who are free, creative, 
and giving. This is what makes America great, not some politician or some law. The spirit of our country rests in us, you and you and you, all of us. And notwithstanding all of our challenges, America is still great. Take any measure, whether it's life expectancy, medicine, nutrition, technology, innovation, transportation, or even economic power. America's economy is still the largest and most productive in the world. We're bigger than the next two economies, China and Japan, combined. America still leads the world in making things. America is among the largest exporters of goods and services in the entire world. America is home to six of the top 10 universities in the world. America is the world's innovator, the world's inventor, and we lead in intellectual property. Don't let anybody, particularly a politician, tell you that America is not great. That doesn't mean we aren't capable of drifting. We can drift, and we have been. And too many Americans are still being left behind or are making it but feel betrayed by a system that's become too big to fail. Too many feel that government and politicians have betrayed them. There are a lot of Americans who ask, why is there no one speaking for me? Why is it no one is working for us? Why is it you hear all these promises from politicians and nothing ever comes from it? And because, of course, those who are concerned about this are right. For too long, politicians have been making promises based upon polling, focus groups, or what is politically expedient. This is not leadership, ladies and gentlemen. Leadership is the willingness to walk a lonely road with a team of people with their eyes fixed on the horizon, focused on solving problems and healing our country. Leading, <laughs> leading is serving. You know, there is a better, higher path. True leadership means pursuing it, even if it's hard. The sacrifice is part of the job, however, because leaders can't lead unless they're servants first. To run for president, you have to respect the dignity of a job where close to 320 million people depend on you. Our campaigns should be full of ideas that provide energy and solutions, innovations, and excitement for whatever office we're running for, because we all have to look our families in the eyes and know that we raise the bar. I want to be able to look at my wife and my daughters in the eyes and know that they're proud of me and the type of campaign that we're running. American leadership is at its finest when it buckles on that irrepressible can-do spirit that says anything is possible and that everyone can participate in America's blessings. You see, I have no doubt that we can restore our economy. We can rebuild our military. We can make America safe from terrorism and re-engage as the leader in the world again. We can do this with reasonable and proven solutions rooted in the American ideals that have seen us through tough days before. The proven solution, ladies and gentlemen, are right in front of us, and we know what needs to be done. There's no better and quicker cure to America's challenges than to grow the economy and stimulate private sector job creation. To have the resources to solve problems, we need economic strength. In the 1990s, when we balanced the federal budget, paid down the federal debt, or a large portion of it, cut taxes, and created surpluses, the result was a sustained period of economic growth, lower interest rates, job creation, and national prosperity. We weren't talking about income inequality or the lack of wage increases because it was happening. Businesses were growing. Unemployment was at historic lows and nearly everyone who wanted a job could find one. In fact, the labor market became a buyer's market for the job seeker. 
But this was no small feat. Think for a moment about what we did. For the first time since Americans walked on the moon, the federal government had a balanced budget. For the first time since man had walked on the moon, we finally got it done. And we didn't only balance the budget, we were also able to reform welfare, and, which ended generational dependency. We reformed the Pentagon to strengthen our defenses. We cut the capital gains tax, and we did much more. You know, I tell younger audiences about this, and they look at me like I'm crazy. They don't believe it ever happened. But we know that it did, and it can happen again. It just takes leadership. The will to challenge the status quo and a willingness to work across the aisle. Yes, we have to be willing to work also with the other party. You see, I think Americans are not only fed up with what Washington is not doing, but I think they're also tired of the partisan bickering. And that doesn't mean you compromise your principles. You know, Ronald Reagan worked with Tim O'Neill. No one ever accused the Gipper of giving up his principles, even though he accomplished things. But that's because Ronald Reagan was a leader. And folks, I want to remind you of that, of that period of time. In 1994, the Republicans captured the House and the Senate and had a majority for the first time in 40 years. The people who showed up in that Congress during that period could care less about polling, focus groups, re-election, or anything else. They came committed to building a stronger America. And when you think about it, balancing a budget, cutting, a ta cutting taxes, paying down debt, reforming welfare, reforming an, uh, the Pentagon and building the military strength, all that got accomplished in a short period of time because we threw politics out the window and we were focused on helping the American people. That's what leaders need to do. One of the things that I've learned through this campaign is it's the job of a leader to first slow down. We all need to slow down and listen to others who sometimes are never listened to. And we need to listen carefully. Then you set an agenda that meets America's needs and you bring everybody together to make it a reality. There is no place for dividing, polarizing, pointing fingers, or trading on short-term political gain. I hold to this philosophy of leadership because I've watched great leaders practice it. They've been successful. And frankly, I've seen it work in my own experience. I worked for 10 years to pass that balanced budget. It was hard work. And when I became chairman of the Budget Committee, our team was able to get it done, even with a Democrat in the White House. We were proud when we reformed welfare. And as a member of the Armed Services Committee, we all came together to reform the Pentagon and realign our military services that resulted in a central command structure that allowed the services to work together. And frankly, it's the same formula that we have used in Ohio. We were facing an $8 billion deficit, and we had lost 350,000 jobs. In a few short years, we turned that deficit into a surplus of $2 billion and gave Ohioans the largest tax cut of any state in the country. We, we even repealed the death tax. Ohio has now created 417,000 private sector jobs, up from the loss of 350,000, and it's working. And we continue to work to make sure that no one is left behind. This can work for America again as well. And ladies and gentlemen, today across our country, when a politician's lips are moving, people think that they're being lied to. You see, a lot of people have wondered, why does he keep talking about what he has done? Why? You see, folks, I'm a citizen, too. And when somebody comes to my door and they want to know if I will vote for them and they tell me what their promises are, I look them in the eye and I say, you know, I know what you say you're going to do, 
but I'd like to know what you've done. Because I've had enough people tell me what they're going to do who never got it done. So what have you done in your lifetime? See, we don't have time for on-the-job training. We don't have time for empty promises. We've got to have somebody with the experience, the knowledge, the know-how, and the record of success to deal with our problems in a turbulent time. Now, based on the fact that my experience in Washington and Ohio have been successful, using a formula to get everybody to work together to rise and provide opportunity for everybody, I proposed a 100-day agenda for when I am president. And I can tell you, be rest assured, we will enact this. We will restore our economy with a fiscal plan that will balance the budget. We will freeze all federal regulations for one year except health and safety and rebuild our rulemaking system to stop crushing small businesses, which kills jobs in our country. We will simplify and we will reduce the taxes on individuals so all Americans can keep more of what they earn and will help our small businesses. We'll reduce taxes on businesses and end double taxation so these businesses will invest in America and not have their money trapped and invested in Europe. We will send welfare, education, Medicaid, infrastructure, and job training back to where we live in the states so the states can be the laboratories of innovation and the laboratories of modeling what works. We'll protect the border and use common sense on immigration reform. That will include a guest worker program. And we will fix Social Security so that we can keep the promises to our seniors and future generations. When we do these things, we will unleash economic growth, which means more jobs, higher wages, and the restoration of the American dream that our children will inherit a better America than what we received from our parents. With increased stability and strength, America can rebuild its military while at the same time reforming the Pentagon to operate like a 21st century enterprise. We have no room for waste in that building because it takes money from the front line to our men and women who protect us every day. We will clean it up. We will resume leadership of the world, and as we do that, we will treat our veterans with respect and lift them to make sure they have what they need, whether it's health care, jobs, or housing. When America is strong, less dependent on debt, and growing economically, we can, we must, reclaim our place as a leader in the world. And finally, when America is strong and actively engaged in the world, the world's a safer place. America, then, is a safer place. You know, this is why we do these things. This is about how we want our country to be. You see, economic growth, I have never believed, is an end unto itself. It is a means to make possible everything we want for our nation and our community and our families. And by the way, as we have growth, we have the ability to bring in from the cold those who live in the shadows, those who have been forgotten, the poor, the mentally ill, the disabled. As Americans, or what I believe too, so sincerely, is that everyone deserves a chance. Everyone deserves a chance to realize their God-given purpose. We give them ch the chance when we give them a hand, and everyone should have that opportunity to pursue their God-given destiny. You know, yes, there's much to fix in our country. There are reasons for our anxieties and fears. Our country has been drifting. Why? <laughs> because we've forgotten the formula that makes us strong, and we've caved to political considerations instead. Not leading not being servants, worried too much about ourselves and what feels good and what's easy. That's not the path to success in our country. We seem to have lost our way as a result, and we are stalled, and we are at the risk of jeopardizing a better future for our kids. 
You know, I do understand why Americans are fearful and distrustful and looking for a reason for the way they feel. You know, I was raised in that small Pennsylvania steel town of McKees Rocks, where if the wind blew the wrong way, people would be out of work. It's awful to feel that insecurity, to feel that circumstances are out of your control, to feel like nobody cares and all the institutions in our land have abandoned you. But we Americans have overcome so many challenges and some many bigger than what we face today. Some think that the anger some Americans are expressing is defined by some nostalg nostalgic look backward for simpler times. I simply do not agree. What Americans are looking for is that quality of leadership we are sorely missing from the past to address today's problems. At each moment of crisis in America, we have united as a country and as a people. It's been our secret weapon all throughout our history. And it's so simple, but it's also invincible. I spoke earlier about the spirit of our country. But let me say, with all the strength I have, our strength and spirit does not reside with a president or with a politician. Our strength resides inside of us. The knowledge that we can change the world. The knowledge that we have been made special. You see, the spirit of our country rests in the neighborhoods. The spirit of our country rests in our people. We are the ones, we, you and me are the ones to change the world. The power is within each and every one of us, and a united America is undefeatable, and we are an exceptional country. And that's because we are the exception in history. We're not an ethnic group or religion or language. We are that last great hope for Earth that Ronald Reagan often spoke of. Because we have shown that when people from many different backgrounds and ideas and beliefs come together with a common noble purpose to be free and just, we're unbeatable. Two paths. One choice, the path that exploits anger, encourages resentment, turns fear into hatred, and divides people. This path solves nothing. It demeans our history, it weakens our country, and it cheapens each one of us. It has but one beneficiary, and that is to the politician who speaks of it. The other path is the one America has been down before. It's well trod. Yes, at times it's very steep, but it's also solid. It's the same path our forebears took together. And it is from this higher path that we are offered the much greater view. And imagine for a moment with me that view. Fear turns to hope because we remember to take strength from one another. Uncertainty turns to peace because we reclaim our faith in the American ideals that have carried us upward before. And America's supposed decline becomes its finest hour because we come together to say no to those who would prey on our human weakness and instead choose leadership that serves, helping us look up, not down. This is the path I believe in. This is the path that America believes in. And this is the America I know all Americans want us to be. Please join me on this higher path. Together, united, we can reclaim the America we love and we hold so dear and lift all of us up to partake in its and the Lord's many blessings. Thank you.